The only good thing about evil villains is that at the end of the game you at least usually get to smack them in their villainous faces. Also, they often have good hair. But what happens when games don't give us the satisfaction of battling the shadowy figures who've been making our lives so miserable throughout the game? A lot of pent-up frustration is what? How am I supposed to go about my life knowing that Harry Flynn, the smarmiest man in video games, remains canonically unpunched by uncharted hero Nathan Drake? Ugh! With a hat tip to Apex Dan Zero on Twitter for inspiring this list, here are the villains in games you never got to have a boss fight with. But we're spoilers for the following. <laughs> You know the whole don't automatically trust strangers thing that you were taught when you were a kid? Well, add to that, don't automatically trust disembodied voices who tell you to go kill giant monsters. But that is what Wanda does in Shadow of the Colossus, in order to bring back his presumed love Mono from the dead. Instead of just letting things lie, literally, he picks up a magical sword and strikes a deal with multi-voiced entity Dormin. And so off he trots on his horsey aggro to slay the 16 Colossi, who honestly were just fine being left alone, thanks. And when they're all dead, he and Mono live happily ever after. <laughs> Lol, just kidding. It's actually really sad. Instead, Wanda gets gradually overcome by some strange force. And then, when the dude who put cursed Mono to death, Lord Emon, finally shows up and shoves a sword in him to stop him, Wanda is consumed by Dormin. Turns out the actual big bad was Dormin, not the Colossi, and maybe it wasn't a good thing that Wanda was being filled with a load of black tendrils after everyone he defeated, because those were fragments of Dormin. Don't trust disembodied voices, and be careful of dark tendrils absorbing into your soul. God, that is a lot to remember. What you might expect next is a battle to fight for Wanda's soul. I mean, this entity tricked you into killing innocent monsters and did not explain the small print. I mean, sure, they said the price might be heavy, but I thought that just meant for me. I didn't realise that meant releasing a dark presence into the world. But instead you stay consumed, playing as Dormin-infused Wanda for a bit, before getting defeated by Lord Emon, who kicked off this whole mess in the first place, a dude you also never get to punch. This leaves Wanda reborn as a small child with horns, Mono brought back to life apparently completely unfazed, and the possibility of Dormin's two voices, male and female, having consumed each of them. So Dormin possesses you, and you don't get to kick them in their stupid horn head as payback. Oh well, at least we know that Agro isn't dead anymore. You got me. Yes. At last. A red squirrel. Gold. Red squirrel? Oh, I think he means me. In Conker's Bad Fur Day, you meet a lot of colourful characters. I am the great mighty poo and I'm going to throw my sh at you. And smelly. Don't forget smelly. However, a more regal character, and I realise Conker has set the bar quite low, is the Panther King, even if he is prone to most unkingly temper tantrums.
hey, you know what they say, there's no point crying over spilt milk. Okay, I'll shut up. Panther King's main concern in life is sorting out his wonky table so that he can sit his most beloved beverage on it without it spilling, and so he tasks his top scientist with finding a solution. And it turns out the solution is using a small, brightly coloured mammal. Get me one of these red squirrels. So Conker's girlfriend Barry gets kidnapped. Well? And everyone and their mum seems to be on the hunt for red squirrels. Look, I tell you I'm not a squirrel. Get your hands off me. What are you then? I'm an elephant. Totally bought it. When you finally come face to face with Panther King, you expect an epic showdown, especially after he orders Berry to be killed. Sorry, dollface. Business is business. Adios. What the? Hey. Mind we Barry? But before you can punch him in his fuzzy face for murdering the least annoying character in the whole game, something happens. <laughs> well, that was unexpected and possibly copyright infringing. Yes, turns out this was the professor's plan all along, using the alien to kill the panther king and then try to kill you. Man, first nobody lets me fight the boss and then a xenomorph gets loose. This is just like when I worked in retail. What? Come on. <laughs> that is brilliant, mate. Yeah. It's an unfortunate fact that the British accent can often sound condescending and sarcastic, even when that's not the intention. Look, look, I finally caught an Articuno on Pokemon Go! Oh, well done. Why does I need to be like that about it? No, I meant it. I really did. And knowing this fact, you might make the same mistake as bequiffed adventurer Nathan Drake in Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, when he decides to give roguish Brit Harry Flynn the benefit of the doubt. We go in through the sewer. I'm loving it so far. That puts us in the courtyard. From there, we scale up the wall, run across the rooftops, and just drop down into the exhibit hall. Bob's your uncle. Inevitably, though, Flynn almost immediately double-crosses Nate at the conclusion of the heist they're planning, deliberately getting him arrested in a betrayal almost as slimy as his pomade-rich haircut. I want to give the guards a decent head start. And so begins a globe-trotting adventure to get back at bad guy Flynn and his sinister paymaster, Lazarevich, who are searching for the lost city of Shambhala. But just when it seems Nate might be getting close to smacking Flynn in his oh so smackable face, this happens. You know, I can't believe. No. You just don't know when to quit, do you? What? No witty remark? Nothing clever to say? Uh, uh, how about if you like clever, then why don't you look in a mirror on opposite day? Okay, we'll work on that. By this point, you'll be absolutely desperate for Nate to give the villainous Flynn a kicking in time-honoured video game tradition. But just when you find your way into a big round room that would be perfect for a boss fight, Flynn rocks up in a cutscene, having been beaten up off-camera by his old boss Lazarevich, and serves up this final insult. You... Parting gift from Lazarevich. Pity he took the pin. Get back! Elena! <laughs> <coughs> no. Oh my god. Helena! Okay, you're gonna be okay. Come on, we're gonna get you out of here. Ah, oh, so aggravating! Okay, okay, we never got to fight Flynn, but there's nothing to stop me restarting the game and then punching Flynn back when Nate had the chance. You son of a bitch! I tried. When you come across Serizawa Kazuhiko, he's not really the friendliest of dudes. Okay, that might be a bit of an understatement. 
See, this detective of the Osaka Prefectural Police knows a lot about you, recognizing Kazuma Kiryu through his excellent taxi driver disguise of Taichi Suzuki, probably because an old pal of his was shouting it from the rooftops earlier. Still, it later turns out that you're not the only one who's been using a secret identity, as Detective Serizawa Kazuhiko turns out to be Tsubasa Kurosawa, the seventh chairman of the Omi Alliance. And he's a man with a plan. Most of the problems you end up dealing with in the game are because this guy has been trying to overthrow both the Omi Alliance and the Tojo clan, thus taking over the two largest Yakuza organizations in the country. So you would expect that this guy is the big bad we've been working our way towards. Yes, this is the guy we have to fight in an epic boss battle. Nah. Instead, he forces you to fight other people, on pain of the death of the adorable singing idol, Haruka, adoptive daughter of Kazuma Kiryu. Oh my goodness, can we please punch this guy? Well, unfortunately, no. Even after taking out his hitman, it's his mate Dejimo who disarms him in a cutscene. <laughs> and then it turns out that Kurosawa is dying of lung cancer, so obviously it would be a bit distasteful to challenge him to a punch-up. And the whole mess was about him trying to give power over to his ungrateful son, Masato Aizawa. Oh, what? At least tell us we get to punch the sun. Ah, <laughs> <sighs> feel a bit better now. You were a tool, an agent with a singular purpose. And despite our differences, you were relatively successful. But like the rest of the relics in this place, your time is over. When it comes to who you want to punch in the face, you'd think that the person who brought you back to life would be pretty low on the list. But the elusive man, leader of Cerberus, who saved Commander Shepard from permadeath at the start of Mass Effect 2, turns out to be, well, a bit of an ass. Don't try my patience. The technology from that base could have secured human dominance in the galaxy against the Reapers and beyond. See, his ultimate goal was to control the Reapers, you know, the weird space entities that like to destroy the universe every time it gets too advanced. Yeah, now that doesn't sound like a bad idea at all. Every time Shepard finds a bit of Reaper technology he could use, there he appears, in hologram form of course, so no one can get at him. So convinced of his ability to control the Reapers, the elusive man becomes indoctrinated, even allowing himself to have Reaper-derived nanotechnology implanted into himself, because nothing says, this is a good idea, like fitting yourself with modifications that are made by the very people out to destroy you. With this, he controls Shep's motor functions, forcing them to shoot the also incapacitated Alliance officer David Anderson in the stomach, just to show off what he can do. Look at the power they wield. Look at what they can do. You know what would be even more impressive and less psychotic? Make them juggle. Even more impressive, no one gets killed. Especially if they do the over the hand thing. Like that. But the worst thing is that if you're going for the Paragon ending, you can't have your revenge. Instead, you finally get through to him, and upon realizing that he screwed up, he shoots himself. I tried, Shepard. Only if you've played as a renegade, which as a reminder involves being a total jerk to everyone you meet throughout the whole game, do you get some measure of revenge, which isn't a big old boss fight, but instead, Shep shooting him in the stomach in a cutscene. You're the one who failed. Look, Shepard, you've got to learn that you can't just solve all your problems by shooting at them. So be it. Or, okay, fair enough.
Yoshi is no stranger to injustice. Consider how it must feel to carry baby Mario around on your back, only for adult Mario to propel you to your death just to save his own skin. Absolutely brutal. But that's not even the greatest injustice that poor Yoshi has had to endure in his time. What's far worse is having to watch flying villain Kamek eluding the beatdown he so sorely deserves in whimsical 2D adventure Super Mario Bros. 2 Yoshi's Island. But hey, it is whimsical. Maybe Kamek's crimes aren't all that serious. I mean, all he's done is steal a baby! Specifically, Kamek brazenly abducts the newborn Luigi, and in the process lets baby Mario plummet thousands of feet, only spared from death because he's lucky enough to smash onto poor Yoshi's head. Yoshi sets off to rescue Luigi and along the way gets tied up in all sorts of surreal boss fights, made exponentially harder by the magic of creepy flying jerk Kamek, including a battle against a possessed plant pot and a brawl inside the belly of a frog, which ends with baby Mario and the long-suffering Yoshi expelled from the animal's, uh, lower end. <laughs> Oh god, I hope that's not Baby Mario's first memory. After this string of indignities, you'd certainly hope that the adventure would end with child thieving Kamek stamped on three times and never seen again. But dream on, because when the final confrontation comes, it's against Baby Bowser, who Kamek has also stolen and transforms into Godzilla proportions with his wicked magic. Put the smack down on Baby Bowser and it's finally time for Kamek to face Yoshi's own brand of sticky tongue justice. Or so you'd think, because the game ends, astoundingly, with Kamek cheesing it into the sky. What the heck? Oh well, don't worry Yoshi, you'll get him back in the next game, Yoshi's Island DS, over 10 years later. Yoshi, I'm not telling you how to do your job, but throw some damn eggs maybe? He's right there! He's right there in the sky! He stole a baby! I think it's time to show you who's the real boss. Come on out, Maleficent! Who's that? Must you always be so exasperating, my dear child? Kingdom Hearts is a series which features a lot of Disney worlds and therefore a lot of Disney villains for you to do battle with. And at the centre of them all is Sleeping Beauty antagonist Maleficent, proud recipient of Best Haunt Award five decades running. In the first game, she is the ringleader of a bunch of Disney big bads, intent on capturing princesses from their different worlds to open the path to Kingdom Hearts. One by one, you keyblade your way through them, bumping into Maleficent along the way, such as when she noped out of this situation real hard. Wait a second, are you Maleficent? When you finally reach Maleficent, you battle her not only in sorceress form, <laughs> but also as a dragon. It's a pretty hefty fight and takes a long time to get to, so when you defeat her, you're fairly chuffed with yourself, having just defeated, you know, a great big bloody dragon. And after that, you carry on in your adventure, safe in the knowledge that she's gone forever and she won't be a problem at all in Kingdom Hearts 2. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yep, annoyingly, just like life, Maleficent uh, finds a way, and she spends Kingdom Hearts 2 wandering from world to world, building an army of Heartless and reviving her old friends that you'd worked tirelessly to defeat in the first game. <laughs> I feel like a million bugs. <laughs> I really owe you one for this, Maleficent. Indeed you do, Oogie. Come on, I just got rid of that guy and I've got
got to do all again. Duh. Okay, you might think. We hit her with the Keyblade in the first game, so surely we get to again in Kingdom Hearts 2? Well, no. When Maleficent makes her move and tries to take over Disney Castle, you don't fight Maleficent at all, instead going back in time to beat up her helper, Pete. <laughs> and don't expect a big boss battle near the end like the first game. Instead, in her desire to find a new base of operations after losing Hollow Bastion to the Goody Two Shoes gang, Maleficent protects Sora, Donald, and Goofy so they can defeat other big bad Xemnas of the shady Organization 13 so she can try to nick his castle afterwards. In other words, you're denied a single Keyblade battle opportunity with a longtime antagonist because she's too focused on owning a nice castle. Girl, you're a Disney villain, not the National Trust. Although I would forgive the lack of a fight if you've got a good gift shop. You can always, you know, add to my pencil collection, maybe? Frankly, my dear, I'd rather run! So those were some of the evil villains in games that at the end we didn't even get to have like a big boss fight with. I mean, what the hell Uncharted? We were right there in a big, it was even a circular 1-8 room with Harry Flynn. And yet, no boss fight. It's very... Luke, I am here to fight you! Ellen, I'm not even a villain. I don't know what's... No, I'm Let's the big bad! No, I know. Oh, oh, you're the big yeah. bad! Oh, right, because it's the end of the video. Now it makes sense. Yeah. All right, well... Okay, I will. No, yeah. Darn, it's happened here as well, even in my real life. The curse follows me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you enjoyed this video, then why not check out some of the other videos we've done. Um, this one up here is about difficult first bosses who deserve a promotion. And this one down here is from our sister channel, Outside Xbox. It is about heroes who live long enough to see themselves become the villain. And if you enjoyed this, then why not subscribe? Thank you for watching, guys. Bye.